So open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 21. I have a question. Did we have a church split since I've been gone? Like, what are you guys all doing over there? There's nobody in the middle except for Dot. So I don't know, Dot, Dot's got the DMZ over here. Uh, <laughs> um, anytime you guys want to move into off the periphery of the Christian walking, come on in. You're always welcome to. So um, we're going to be walking our way through Luke 21. I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. It's a there's a lot we could go through. I'll try not to drill down too far, but uh, you guys can handle that if we do. Um, pardon me. You're probably familiar in Deuteronomy. Moses says, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, he said that the Lord will send another prophet like unto me. And uh, of course, he's prophesying about the Messiah Jesus. Um, so where does Jesus, in what way was Jesus a prophet? Well, here, as we get into what scholars like to call it, the Olivet Discourse. You always have to have a title that sounds highfalutin. Uh, he, he talked to, he gave a, he gave a, 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 he gave a security briefing to his four innermost guys, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, on the Mount of Olives. So if you go to seminary, you have to call it the Olivet Discourse or something. But anyhow, I don't think Jesus called it that. I think he was just telling people. Uh, but um, this is, you know, if you look for the longest sermon in the Bible, that would be in the book of Matthew, right? The Sermon on the Mount. But this is his longest answer to any question. And there's a lot that we learn here. Um, many people, when we talk about the Olivet Discourse or this, this uh, sermon, if you will, if that's what it is, on the Mount of Olives, we tend to think of the Matthew 24 version. Um, and, and most people would say, and I, I would too, that Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21 are parallel passages. In many ways, that's very true. Um, Matthew and Mark certainly are parallel passages, uh, although if you compare them, chapter 24 of Matthew is really long. Mark 13 is relatively short, so it ha they're parallel in what way? Well, they're parallel because he's talking about the same thing. The difference, of course, is that Matthew was a tax collector. He knew shorthand, so he took down so much information. He recorded, that's why you know, the things that he, he speaks of or he writes about are so elaborate. Um, compared to Mark. If, actually, if you were, you don't care. But anyhow, um, if you were to take the way that Matthew writes and apply it to Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel would be much longer. It's just very quick. It's like a shooting script. And, he, you know, and then Jesus, and then Jesus, and then he did this, and then he said that. He's just very quick. He's right, right to the point. Matthew's more like me. He, you know, he just goes on and on. Um, Luke is writing to a different crowd. He's, he's writing principally to Gentiles. So his, you know, he'll pick up on things that, that Matthew may not or Mark may not. But there's still parallel between them all. Some of you are thinking, ah, does that really matter? Well, maybe not. But, but where Luke is different from Matthew and Mark in terms of this topic, what topic? The destruction of the temple and the last days. Um, where Luke is different is that he spends a much, much, much greater amount of time talking about the destruction of the temple that were, that's coming in 70 AD. So uh, it's always one of those things I think, you know, how do you just, maybe we should just jump in. Um, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, let's read, and then we'll go back and take a look. That's not my typically the way I would do things on a Wednesday night, but let's do that. Um, first of all, let's, let's deal with these first five, four, four verses, and then we'll go on from there. Uh, Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. Uh, a mite is about a sixteenth of a penny, you might say. So two mites, an eighth of a penny. Not very much in any age, right? Um, and uh, so Jesus said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Um, 
speaks for itself, really. There's a lot we could do here, but I want to focus on the prophecy itself tonight. But Jesus is remarking on this, and especially now following, let's, let's step back and get perspective on where we are. Uh, the last time I was with you, um, we were in chapter 19, looking at the triumphal entry of Christ, and especially that Wednesday night, talking about Jesus' prophecy of, you know, be, because they, they should have known on this day when he would present himself as king. But because they didn't know, because they refused to care, he says, now it's hidden from your eyes. And we went into some detail. Some of you might have zoned out. Some of you might have really liked it. But uh, to me, the most exciting prophecy in all of Scripture is Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. So we looked at that because that's what Jesus was referring to when he said, because you did not know this, you were supposed to know this. Um, he, says, he says, everything that you have, all of this is now hidden from your eyes, and there will come a day when your enemies, he says, will build an embankment around you, hem you in on every side, you and your children within your walls, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the day of God's coming to you. Um, that's where we left off last time. We spent a lot of time going into uh, the Daniel prophecy. And then uh, Josh took us through chapter 20. So here we are now in, in chapter 21. We look at things, when we read the Bible, we look at it in chapters. They're like just nice slices for us. But we tend to define things. When we read the Bible, we tend to define things by chapters and forget the context or the calendar or which days we're in. Luke is writing to us about Jesus' last week on planet Earth. Chapter 9 is his triumphal entry. Church language, we call it Palm Sunday, but the day of his triumphal entry. It's really not his triumphal entry. That's just another church language. His triumphal entry is coming in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation when he comes on a white horse with King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. And he slays his enemy with one, his enemies, all of the enemies on planet Earth with one word that proceeds from his mouth. It's not, we always call it the, the battle of Armageddon. It's no battle. It's just ball game. Uh, bloody, but it's a ball game. It's, it's over uh, before the first inning's over. And, and so we see this triumphal, what we call the triumphal entry. Now he comes back, some would say, the second day. Depending upon which gospel you read, you can feel like this is the same day. I see it as the next day. Uh, Steve spoke on Sunday about Jesus going from there, triumphal entry, into the temple and overturning the tables of the money changers. All of that's associated here with his triumphal entry. Now, it, that would have been what we call a Sunday. This I would call a Monday. I say that just to give you perspective, and I know some people believe that Jesus is crucified on a Friday, and you can believe whatever you want to as long as you understand that he died for your sins and he rose again on the third day. I don't care really what you, you believe, but if you want to be right, he was crucified <laughs> on a... <laughs> it's only my opinion. On a Wednesday. Uh, you can make the case Wednesday or Thursday. We've been through some of that before. But in any event, so if you see then where we're at here, so, uh, and for context, I just want us to, to understand, you can go back there if you want to look at it, but there is a lot that happens between the triumphal entry and when he speaks to his disciples there on the Mount of Olives. And one of the things he does is in chapter 23 of the book of Matthew, where he rails against the Pharisees. This is the one time where he comes out strong. Seven woes. Woe to you, Pharisees. You know, you, you, know, you hypocrites. You, you, know, you tied this, but you... Anyhow, he goes through all of these things. And at the end of that, Jesus weeps. He convulses. Don't look at Jesus, uh, just a sweet little tear coming down his eyes. He's convulsing over Jerusalem. When we think of Jerusalem today, we think politics. When we think of Israel, we think politics. No, I, I want to circle back to this. I hate that phrase, but I used to love it. But in recent years, I've learned to hate it. But anyhow, um, we'll come back to it later on, this whole matter of nations. There were all the nations on planet Earth until God called a man, Abram, from Ur of the Chaldees, we would call it Kuwait today, and he said, come, follow me. 
And he, and he says, this is what I'll do. He said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. Seven promises that God makes to Abram, chapter 12 of Genesis, uh, in those first three verses. And, and what he says, specifically important for us to understand, I will make you a nation. This man who comes from the nations, uh, nation in Hebrew, some of you are thinking, he, he says one thing, he just goes somewhere else, like, will he ever come back? I will. I, I tend to go on tangents every once in a while, and it's taken me a couple of years, but I always get back. <coughs> nation in Hebrew is goy. So the nations are goyim. I know that just really makes your palms sweaty when you hear that, but I just want you to understand, that's why you and I, to a Jewish person, we're called the goyim. We're the ones from the nations. We're Gentiles. So Gentile is just a, an anglicized word for the nations, okay? So I, I say that because there's only, even though there's all kinds of ethnic groups on planet Earth, and, and they're represented in this room, we're all the nations. Everybody was from the nations. Abram was from the nations. And God calls him and says, I will make you a nation. I'll make you into a nation. And he begins there. He makes the promise to him, a man who has no children, who's married to a wife who's barren, and already they're old. So what are the chances of ever having children? I, he makes a promise, you will have a son, and from him I will bring this nation. And so you know this story, I'm sure. But it's important for us to understand the whole biblical story. That's all the way back in Genesis. So some of you are thinking, he's not going to go through all this tonight, is he? No, I'm not. But I want you to understand that's important. So when Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's convulsing in Matthew 23. In fact, I want you to think about this. What's he really saying? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, persecute the prophets and kill those who God sends to you. How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. I tell you the truth. Your house is left to you desolate. House means two things in a Jewish context. The temple is the house of prayer, right? And, and also the nation, the house of David, so to speak. Your house is left to you desolate. And I tell you the truth, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He says that while he's convulsing, after he's given those seven woes to the Pharisees, and now he turns from there and he goes up the Mount of Olives. I say that to give some context to this. So he he brings his four of his 12 apostles and he brings them up the Mount of Olives. Uh, actually, I think it's Matthew who records that the guy said to him, uh, do you know that the Pharisees were kind of upset by what you said? Like, they were always real quick to, on, him, on the draw. Uh, they really understood what was going on. Yeah, Captain Obvious. Um, and, and it's from there that Jesus begins to say the things that he says here in chapter 21. And so he says... Um, in verse 5 of chapter 21. Then as some spoke of the temple, as they stood up there, Matthew tells us that, that the guy said to Jesus, look at all of this, the temple complex. And, and, and unless you've studied it, it's hard to appreciate how vast this was and how, how splendid it was, uh, how rich it was. Um, and so they, they spoke of this because what they were really doing, it would be like us, regardless of your politics, if we were to, to speak of our buildings in Washington, D.C., regardless of who's in them. But we, we think of the background, we think of the history, we think of everything that's there. We can be proud of that. That's not wrong, you know, it, but we can be very proud of that far more because these guys... They have God associated with all this. As they look at this temple that's 200 feet tall, if you look at, at pictures of Jerusalem today and you see the Dome of the Rock there, it looks really big. The Dome of the Rock, the very top of that golden dome, only came to the doorway of that temple. 
Yeah, I mean, this thing was enormous. It sat on 35 acres. That Temple Mount is 35 acres. And it took up a major portion of that. It was the whitest marble you can imagine. And there were tons, I'm, I'm telling you, tons of gold in this. Plates of gold on, on all these sides of it and all around the top. Because they didn't want pigeons, you know, sitting on the top and doing what birds do on the top. That would defile the temple in their mind. So they had all these spikes, golden spikes. So when you looked at the temple from almost anywhere, if you were coming from the Mediterranean or you were coming up from the Jordan Valley and you looked up toward Jerusalem, when on a sunny day, you could hardly look up there because the sun would be reflecting off of that. It was all designed to cause you to humble yourself before the Lord and say, wow, I'm on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and I'm going to meet with God there. That was its intention. Now, the religion had become corrupt. Nevertheless, that was the intention of all of this. And it was corrupt. And that's why Jesus said what he said in Matthew 23, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, here are the guys, after saying to him, you know, the Pharisees were not real happy about some of the things you said. And they showed him the temple, and they showed, they pointed to it, it's not like he didn't know, him, uh, but they, they showed it, look at this, isn't this amazing? Look at what God has done. He says to him, these things which you see, verse 6, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, it sounds like a repeat in some ways of what we read in chapter 19, but he's telling them again what you heard me say yesterday. This is what's going to happen. These things you're looking at that look so permanent and impossible to fall apart. This is exactly what's going to happen. Now, you, now how would you feel? You wouldn't be si sitting there like you're sitting here and saying, eh, yeah, okay, interesting. That would rock your world because that's the that's that's like the foundation of everything you are as a Jewish person. And he's saying it's all going to be destroyed. Now, just so that we keep it in mind, um, when we talk about the temple, you know, this all begins with the tabernacle in the wilderness, you know, as, a, as, as they leave Egypt in the Exodus and they end up at Sinai and Moses goes up on the mountain and we know that he gets the uh, the Ten Commandments up in those 40 days. He actually spends 80 days. It's 40 days and 40 nights, two times. Um, and he gets, the, he gets the law, but he also gets uh, basically blueprints for the tabernacle. God tells him how the tabernacle is to be designed, how it's to be built, and then he comes down and they begin the process. So that um, after two years out in the wilderness, they have all this in place. They're actually ready after two years to go into the promised land. 40 days of wandering, but two years, they're ready to go. And you know the story, they send 12 spies into the land, spies come back, uh, two give a good report, and, and um, to Joshua and Caleb give a good report, and 10 give an evil report. In both cases, they say, we saw giants in the land, we saw the Nephilim there, and we were as grasshoppers in their eyes and also in our own. And and we shouldn't go in, say the, say the 10. Joshua and Caleb say, yeah, giants. Caleb says, give them to me. We'll have them for breakfast. Come on, let's go. <laughs> really, that's what he's saying. He's, he's quite a guy. He's a, he's a let's get moving kind of a guy. Because they've learned you can trust God, but the others are judging by what they're seeing. Not uncommon for some of us, huh? We all do that sometimes. And I say that because it's important. It's because of that. Because the people believe the 10 spies, God says, you're going to spend 40 years out in the wilderness. One day each, one year each for the days that the spies were in the land, you will spend a year in, in the wilderness. He gave them credit for the first two years that they were there, so it was 38 more years. That all becomes important later on. I know some of that sounds like overkill, but I just want you to understand that. So the tabernacle is constructed out in the wilderness. They come into the land, and after they're in the land, and the tabernacle is at Shiloh. After a while, it's moved up into the Jerusalem area. David is king. He wants to make a, a temple for the Lord. The Lord says, uh, that's a great idea, but you're not the man because you're a man of blood. You're a warrior, but your son, a son of peace, one who will come from your loins, Solomon. He's the one who'll build that temple. David says, that's fine, but I'll design it and I'll 
I'll provide the funding and all the materials for it. And so after he dies, Solomon builds the temple. That's Solomon's temple. It's destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians. It's rebuilt later on after, after they come back out of Babylon. And Zerubbabel is the one, always remember, Zerubbabel builds the temple from the rubbable, okay? <laughs> Zerubbabel is the one who builds the temple. And, uh, and then later on, it's Herod who adds on. I mean, he completely rebuilds it, but he adds on. That's called the second temple. So you have the tabernacle. Don't worry, this all fits together later. Tabernacle. First temple, Temple of Solomon. Second temple, Zerubbabel's, but many people call it Herod's temple. Destroyed 70 AD by the Romans. The first temple was destroyed on a certain day. In Hebrew, Tisha B'Av, or we would call it the ninth of Av. Av is a Jewish month. The ninth day of the month of Av, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. On Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av, the 10th of August that year in 70 AD, Rome destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, you can do some studying and find out other things that happened on the ninth of Av. The Spanish Inquisition, when all the Jews were expelled, including Columbus, I might add, who was a Marino, who, who was a Jew, but he converted to, to Christianity uh, so as not to be killed. But he was expelled. That's probably the reason he left when he did. But 1492. You can go down the list, all these things that happened on the 9th of Av. It's interesting how all of the leaders of the world conspire to bring all their persecutions against Jewish people always on the same day. Isn't that interesting how that works? You don't believe that, do you? No, because there are no coincidences. Coincidence is not a kosher word. There, it's, it's just it's the way it works. God's the one who's behind all of this. I say this because Jesus is saying that, in, that days are coming when this will occur. And he said, not one stone uh, will be left on another. They'll all be thrown down. I think I mentioned uh, last time that what happened was the temple began to burn. Long story, people have different opinions. It appears that a soldier fired one of those flaming arrows through one of the upper windows of the temple. It's all limestone. But inside, it's cedar. Imagine the cedar that's been up there for 40 years. It's dry. It's covered with gold. The cedar begins to burn. The gold begins to melt. And as it gets hotter and hotter, limestone that has a high moisture content now begins to explode. And so the, um, the gold is melting down. Titus, you know, the, the General Titus, is ticked. He wanted to keep this as a trophy of war. So he does the second best thing. He has his soldiers pry bar one stone from another in order to get the gold. That's, that's what happened. And if you've been to Jerusalem, you've seen it for yourself, and you don't have to go there. You can, you can just look it up online. Not one stone is left on another. It's down mostly in the Tropian Valley and much of it in the Kidron Valley, the, the western side Tropian, the eastern side, the Kidron Valley. It's exactly what the Romans did. You can even see where they scraped the gold. It's exactly what Jesus said would happen, not one stone would be left on another. And so they asked him, well, teacher, then when will these things be? When is this going to happen? And, and, and what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Jesus says, take heed that you not be deceived. There's a lot of things that, that, uh, that Jesus says in this passage whether you're looking in Luke or you look over in Matthew. He begins to talk about some of the things that are going to happen. And in one regard, it's, sometimes you get confused if you're comparing it to Matthew, because Matthew says many of these things, but he's talking about the end days, as, as, we, as we're in the you know, Daniel 70th week, or what we call the, the, the seven-year tribulation period. And, uh, and but... Jesus is saying, what, or what Luke is recording Jesus as saying here, have a lot to do with when the temple itself will be destroyed. So some of it is just looking a few years ahead. Other times he's looking thousands of years ahead. So sometimes you can get a little confused. I don't think I'm confused. I'm just telling you it's easy to get confused. But he says, don't be, don't be deceived. Many will come in my name saying that I'm, I, I am he or that the time is drawn near, but don't go after them. And some, some of this is very much the, the case throughout time. As he 
he says, when you hear of wars and commotions, or wars and rumors of wars, it might say over in Matthew, when you hear of wars, when you hear of commotions, don't be terrified. Hey, by the way, I don't know how you feel about some of the things that you're hearing in the world today. I don't know how you feel about terrorism in the world today. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you feel terrified. But if I asked you to do it and you didn't raise your hand, I'd say there's Lyra's Lyra's pants on fire in here. Because many of us are terrified about what may be. We think of the southern border and what kind of, what kind of people are now in our country. Uh, it's right to be thinking of that. But listen, Christian, to what Jesus is saying. When you hear of these things, when you hear of wars, when you hear of rumors of wars, don't be terrified. He says, because these things must first come to pass, but the end will not immediately come. The end is not yet. He says, nation will rise against nation. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they'll lay their hands on you. Let's stop there for a minute. Very often when we read these things, and, and I've, I've done this myself as a teacher, it's right to say we could, I, I could, I could easily bore people, you know that, um, and, or, or to pour out all kinds of data for you to consider. I think it's worthwhile to consider the wars on planet Earth right now and, and, or to look through the last 300 years at Europe and say, what year was there not a conflict somewhere in Western Europe? You can't find one. It's always been that way. There are always wars. See, we have a tendency to say these signs that Jesus are talk is talking about, these are prophecies. No, he's saying this is just the way it's going to be. It's not a prophecy in the sense that it's a specific promise that will come to pass later on. Like the temple will be destroyed. That's a specific prophecy. But he says there are going to be wars. There are going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. Now, you can look at earthquake data, and you should look it up if you don't believe me. Go to USGS, you, you know, the, the US Geological Survey, and, and look at the, uh, the, the, the predominance of earthquakes in increasing magnitude over the last 50 years anywhere on planet Earth, they're becoming closer and closer together and higher and higher magnitude. Gee, that's exactly what Jesus said. Now, I don't need to tell you because you believe this stuff. I hope. But this is what Jesus said. But at the same time, these are not specific prophecies that we can say, well, he said this, and so that happened. He said this, and that happened. They are happening Wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. I think it's important for us to remember sometimes. We don't see ourselves, United States, we don't see ourselves as a kingdom. We see ourselves as the United States. Even when we look at ourselves as the church, we don't necessarily see ourselves as the kingdom. Because depending on what part of the church you're in and what your, what your eschatology is, uh, and from the, my perspective is the kingdom is yet to come. But by the way, if you ask a Muslim about us, we're the kingdom. We're, we are a kingdom and they're a kingdom. And from their perspective, there are two kingdoms at war right now. We're just peace, love, dove, hippies, communists, power of the people. You know, well, no, that's, that was in the 70s. But you know, we, we see things as like, no, we gotta love everybody. That's not the way Islam looks at us. And no matter who you're talking about, yeah, we got good terms with Saudis and, and all that right now. Uh, but I'm not going to dive into all that. But they're looking for the Mahdi. Do you know who the Mahdi is? The, or the 12th Imam? That's what, what we would call the Antichrist. They're looking for that one who's going to bring chaos on planet Earth to destroy this kingdom in order for them to have rule over planet. Have you ever thought about that? That Islam actually has an eschatology too? Mm -hmm. Satan is the great imitator. He has always imitated the church and you can look at the writings in the Quran and they're always sort of the inside out version of what God has given us in his word. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes in various places. Famines... 
and pestilences. Pestilences, he's not just talking about bugs. Uh, he could be talking about all sorts of things. I mean, think of some of the, the words we've started to learn in, in these days, over these years. You know, we think of Ebola, AIDS. We think of all kinds of viruses. We never thought we'd be talking about COVID. Um, you know, I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago. You know, I always used to think about the Spanish flu. That was always amazing to me. Right after the First World War, the Spanish flu. It's only called the Spanish flu because that was the, those were the first deaths they found in Spain. But uh, 1918, think about this. The Spanish flu was that kind of virus that if you, you could start to show symptoms at breakfast and be dead before bedtime, it moved that fast. In fact, in Philadelphia in that year, 1918, 250,000 people died in Philadelphia out of a population of 750,000. One third of the population of Philadelphia died from the Spanish flu. There are various estimates about the worldwide death toll. Um, some would say 100 million, others say, no, nah, that's too much, it's really more like 50 million. I don't care, that's a chunk of people with that kind of a virus. Jesus says, you're gonna see these pestilences. No one ever talks about the, the plague anymore, the black plague, no one talks about that stuff, but that was enormous. Pestilences, those types of things. Oh, by the way, the Spanish flu, when they do autopsies on people now, they find out yeah, it was an avian flu. The, the same thing that we had during, the, I'm not bringing that Obama, I'm just saying, during the Obama administration when people talked about the avian flu, all kinds of pestilences, not, not to mention HIV and some of these others. Um, Jesus says all of these things are going to happen. There will be fearful signs and fearful sights and great signs in the heaven. He says, but before all these things, before all these things, now, now listen, church, I want you to understand as you read this, don't see yourself in this. I really want you to hear me because we have this tendency, I know it can be a real nag, sometimes we do our Bible studies and staff meeting, you know, I'll say, now wait, you know, this is on this side of the cross, you know, we're here, looking back at the cross. But the things that are going on here, that they don't know there's a cross coming, right? And so here's Jesus. Who are the people he's speaking to? Is he speaking to Christians? No. They're not, we say they're apostles. Of course they're Christians. Well, I'm, but they're Jews. In their perspective, they're Jews. He's the Jewish Messiah and he's bringing in the kingdom. I don't want to break your brain with this, but just think about this for a moment. When Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. You were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What would have happened if they had said yes? Have you ever processed that? I said, I don't want to break your brain, but I want you to think about this for a minute. See, because our understanding, our understanding of who we are redeemed in Christ is because Israel rejected their Messiah. That's why the Gentiles have the, gospels preach, the gospel preached to us. And, and when I say I don't want to break your brain, I'm not going to go into this deep thing about uh, <laughs> predestination and free will. But Israel had free will, as you have free will. They had the will to reject it, and yet God had a plan to redeem his own people, Israel, which is still to come. So, you know, it's, it's sometimes we look at these things and just think, well, everything happens on a timeline, and that's, you know, everything's linear. No, it's, it's not. God is ultimately in control of it all, certainly. But even though he's sovereign over all things, he still allows you to make decisions. It'd be like God saying, Charles, we're going to play chess. And I'm sovereign and you're not. So I'm going to determine every move you make and then I'll win. Right? That's, that's one group's view of God's sovereignty, okay? 
The free will version would be, Charles, we're going to play chess. You can make any move you want to make, but I'm still going to win. Okay, that's the free will version of it. I say, I don't want to break your brain, but I think sometimes we need to dig a little bit underneath the words we're so used to reading all the time. And to understand God's plan in all of this, he allows, in this case, Israel to have complete control. Now, I began this ramble by saying, over this most recent ramble, by, by saying, church, I want you to understand, don't look at yourself in this. Who's, he, who's his audience? In this case, specifically four guys who are guys he's called his apostles. He knows what they're going to be, you know, one day, you know, the, the pillars of the church. He knows all that. They don't understand that stuff yet. In fact, they, you can even see it in the first chapter of Acts. After he's been with them for 40 days, resurrected, been with them for 40 days, and he's standing on the same mountain, Mount of Olives, and he's ready to basically get raptured, basically to, to, to go up into the sky, to, be, to seat the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven. And they say to him, now? Is it now? Are you going to bring your kingdom now? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. See, they don't understand the things we think they understand sometimes. So it's okay not to understand these things. And yet we've been given his word so that we should understand these things. So I say, don't look, don't read the church into this because it's not the church. He's speaking about Israel. So when he says to his guys... Verse 12, don't worry, we're making better progress than it may look like. When he says, but before all of these things, they will lay their hands on you and they will persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and to prisons. Do synagogues have the ability to persecute nowadays? No. 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 In that day, they did during the first century until, until Jerusalem was destroyed. A million Jews were killed and hundreds of thousands were taken off as slaves and captives uh, to Rome. You know, then basically Jerusalem was destroyed as a, as a physical nation. Yeah, they still, re uh, all Jewish people still retained their ethnic distinction, but they were scattered to the nations. You and I don't appreciate that. You know, we can maybe know the history, but we don't appreciate the pain of that and the horror of that and what that would have been like just in terms of national identity, let alone personal pain and, and loss. And so were Christians persecuted by the synagogue? You know, Jewish people who followed this Messiah, were they persecuted by the synagogues during the first century? You betcha. Read the book of Acts, right? Paul, Stone, and Lystra. I mean, you think of the things that happen. So don't see yourself in this necessarily, okay? Think of it in a Jewish context. He says, uh, they're going to, they're going to persecute, deliver you up to synagogues, prisons. You'll be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you. And by the way, there, there's a principle here that still applies to us. I'm just saying, in its immediate context, understand the, the audience. It will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Isn't that what you think every time when, you know, people come down on you at work and call you an idiot? That's the nicest thing they can call you. They probably call you other things. But uh, they used to call me that. Um, you know, are you thinking, oh, this is a great occasion for testimony? But Jesus is saying it is. Yeah. By the way, this is a prophecy then. When that happens... Don't worry about it. It's a great occasion for a testimony. Therefore, settle it in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you're going to answer. Now, I know of pastors who will say, hey, I don't think about what I'm going to say before I get up there because Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to give me what to say when I get there. That's bending the scripture into, you know, into Fruit Loops. And then you're one to do it if you believe that. No, that's not what he promised. He said, when you're persecuted, don't, don't have a written sermon prepared. Just, just understand at the time, the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say when the time comes. 
It will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or to resist. And you'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. Now, some of that's still true today, okay? But that was, I mean, of course that's true. Uh, especially if you're talking uh, about very strict religious uh, groups like Islam. Or in Orthodox uh, Judaism, this happens over in Israel. Uh, I know that for certain. Um, he says, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. You say, well, how does he define hurt then? Because he's basically saying, you're going to die, but not a hair of your head's going to be. Um, who you are will remain intact even when you're outside of this body, he's saying. He's saying, why shouldn't I be afraid of that? He's saying, don't. By the way, if, you, if you've never taken the occasion to read it, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs is a wonderful read. Now, it's a thick read, and you can get you can get the Reader's Digest, but they don't call it that, but it's basically you know, the, the summary form of Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you want to start there and then go to the tome, you can do that. But um, I think it's good for us as Christians to read about Roman soldiers who were persecuted, about all these Christians throughout you know, the first 1,500 years or so of the church and the persecutions they were under, because those things are coming for us. I, every time I say that, I know most people are like, uh-huh, but don't believe it. But it really is. They're coming for us. And I know we of, often think, I do, yeah, I hope I'm raptured before that. Yeah. Or, uh, gee, gee well, I'm almost 70, so maybe I'll die before all that happens. So that, <laughs> no, he says, we're going to be persecuted. And I think we see it coming. We don't like to admit it to ourselves, but even in our own nation, we see this coming. The tables are turning. Yes. We are not as as the, the Christian presence in America is not what it used to be, no. but not, by, not by a long shot. But when you see Jerusalem, see, now he's coming back to the destruction of the temple. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. See, if you were to take this and to compare it to Matthew 24, You'd think, well, he's going to talk about the abomination of desolation. Matthew records Jesus as saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand. Then those of you who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. If you're on the housetop, don't go down just to get anything, just leave. That's speaking of the future when the Antichrist is ruling and the third temple is in place. Here, he's talking about the second temple that will be destroyed. So it's, it's important that we get it. The way Luke records this for us is important to understand. It. So he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, meaning the five legions of the Roman army, that's 30,000 battle-hardened soldiers. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of Jerusalem depart and let not those who are in the country to enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, Rome's vengeance. These are the days of vengeance, he says, that all things which are written will be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people. And they'll fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive to the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. He's speaking of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now listen, it's a, some of you care and some of you don't, but I'll, I'll, I'll approach the ones who care about it. What does he mean when he says? What does he mean when he says, after the destruction of the temple, after you know, millions die, and after hundreds of thousands are taken away captive to the nations, you know, distributed, cast to the winds, what does he mean when he says, and Jerusalem 
will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. What is the time of the Gentiles? It's an interesting phrase that, that is used in Scripture. Well, Jesus is the one who uses it, the only one who uses it, and Luke is the only one who records him saying it. What is it? People have different opinions about it. I think, safely speaking, you could, you could the, if you have a period of time called the time of the Gentiles, you must have a starting point, and he's saying there's going to be an ending point. So what's the starting point? I would say the starting point was when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in 586. That was the beginning. The Gentiles trampled on Jerusalem, and they, and they killed many. They took away the rest uh, captive, and they left a few in the land. For all practical purposes, Israel was decimated. You know, our terminology, decimated. Yes, they come back, and then they got problems with the Greek kings. It's just one thing after the other, and then the Romans and all that. Then the temple's destroyed by Rome. Uh, then, of course, in 134 B.C., Bar Kokhba leads a revolt against Rome. He actually, he and his army end up destroying a full legion of Roman soldiers. And uh, Emperor Hadrian was so ticked that he plowed Jerusalem under. And he's the one who gave Israel the name Palestinia. He's the one who gave it the name Palestine. And he named it after their ancient enemies, the, the Philistines. So the time of the Gentiles must have been from, you know, from, from the Babylonian invasion through the Greeks and, and, and through the Romans and then on out. The question is, when did it end or, or did it end? A lot of people, people I love and, and respect, would say that, well, the time of the Gentiles ended during the Six-Day War in 1967. It ended. And yeah, that made sense back in the 70s. That felt right. Well, you look at it today, it doesn't seem that way, does it? Um, so as you work through it, I think you'd be safe to say that the time of the Gentiles will continue. Jerusalem continues to be a divided city, continues to be a disputed city. Listen, if you, if you don't hear anything else, understand this. Zechariah really makes the case. The other prophets say it too. But Zechariah certainly makes the case that God says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to the nations, a burdensome stone, he said, and I will destroy all those nations who come against my city, Jerusalem. So that certainly suggests that the time of the Gentiles continues all the way on out into the tribulation period until Jesus has victory at Armageddon and and then restores Jerusalem to his people. So anyhow, so, um, and, and listen, I understand there are different opinions on this. I'm, I'm probably wrong. Um, but that's my opinion, and for now I'm sticking to it. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon. This is, let me tell you, I don't care whether you're talking about Israel or the church, however you want to look at this. It's creepy. I want you to really think about what he's saying here because we're going to end on this. It's always good to end on something creepy. <laughs> there will be signs in the sun. I wonder what he means. Really, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, you know, but, but you think of solar flares and you think just what a solar, uh, I've often said, you know, we're, we're all so dependent on these silly devices. What happens when the grid goes down? Well, we know that we have, you know, well, national governments and a world government who would like to take total control of the grid and control everybody's use of a device. But I got a feeling that God has no problem in just sending a solar flare and <laughs> And, and all the circuits are fried. <laughs> signs in the sun, signs in the moon. Hmm. Signs in the stars. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth. This is an interesting phrase, distress of nations. Finish it off, with perplexity. Huh? Well, perplexity means no way out. The Greek word, I think it's aphorea. Uh, doesn't matter, you don't care. I could, I could schmooze you with that one. But anyhow, the, if you look it up, the word means there are no resources left. 
There's nothing you can do about it, is what it means. That's what, it's not perplexity like, gee, should I turn right or should I turn, it's not that. I, I am perplexed what I should do today. No, <laughs> saying there's nothing you can do about it. That's coming. See, no matter what you think, no matter what you think, I gotta, if you keep coming back, you must have a similar view of eschatology as I, but no matter what you think about the return of the Lord, that's got to get your attention. That there's coming a time on planet Earth distress of nations. Now, when we think nations, we think national boundaries. But the word is ethnos, as in, what do you hear in that? Ethnos, what do you hear in that? Ethnicity, ethnic groups, right? Jesus says uh, over in Matthew that um, the gospel will go throughout the world until until it's reached every nation, I'm paraphrased, paraphrasing. That's why some people say Jesus can't come back yet because it hasn't reached all nations. No, the word is not nations like national boundaries, it's ethnos, every ethnic group. And if you look at it that way, every ethnic group has already been reached. What happens from there, that's a different story. Distress of ethnos, what does that mean? Ethnic against ethnic. That's an interesting way to look at planet Earth. We don't look at it that way, but I think it's an important way to look at it, and here's why. First of all, because, <coughs> number one, because as we look at it in terms of our own day and age, that would be a tough situation. We see it brewing. I mean, we see, we, we see our own leaders trying to, you know, gin that one up. But think back. A lot of us, when we read the New Testament, we never think back to the prologue of the book. I mean, how many of us really, when we're reading this, are thinking, huh, what can I learn about this from the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis? You don't. Most of us don't do that. But what do the first 11 <laughs> chapters of Genesis teach us? God creates all things. It's perfect. The devil tries to, you know, to mess it all up. He brings sin into the world. God promises a redeemer to come. Then the devil does something really weird by angels intermarrying with women and this whole Nephilim thing starts. And that continues, even though God destroys many through the flood, it still continues later on. And we see it today even. But as we go after the flood and God tells everybody to leave the ark, to leave the mountains of Ararat and spread throughout the world. And then there's one, Nimrod, who says, let's build, let's build a tower that'll reach to the heavens so that we can reach God our way, on our terms, basically is what he's saying. What, and what does he say? Lest we be scattered abroad throughout the earth. Lest we obey God is what he's saying, right? Because God said, be scattered, leave, go around the world. He says, lest we scatter, let's do this. So what does God do? What does he do? He confuses their language because they all had one language. And it forces them to move out in different directions from there. The nations, that's when you read the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you read the table of nations. You read 70 basic ethnic groups on planet Earth. It all starts there. Yeah, we, ha we see all the various combined forms of them today, but God never looks at it that way. He looks at the original 70 groups. So when God says later on in the Bible, when Jesus said, distress of ethnos, and there's no way out. Oh, that ought to get our attention. That really ought to get our attention, and I think it especially gets our attention because never, to my recollection or my understanding of history, never in history has it been that on a global scale. But we see it happening today. Oh, now that, that you can take home and understand those are the days we live in. And Jesus goes on from that to say, you'll see distress of ethnos with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Men's hearts failing them from fear and from the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We're not there yet. I believe that's, that's a time period, or that's, a, that's an event that will be happening during the tribulation period, at the end when the powers of the heavens are shaken. <laughs> but but can you imagine how bad that will be? Because we only see 
the small version of it now. We see, again, you know, it, it, it's, it's a well-used phrase when, when Paul says that the restrainer, the one who restrains evil is now in place, but there's coming a point where the restrainer will, will step out of the way and the full force of evil will flood planet Earth. What we see on planet Earth today is the restrained version of evil, and I hate it. I, 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 I just look at a movie from the 90s and I think how quaint things were. You know, at the time it was so modern to look at, but now I think, wow, that's quaint. That kind of long for those days, you know? And, and I think about raising kids in the 80s and 90s, and we, we thought things were weird and wicked then. And now we look at our grandkids and think, oh, we tell our kids, protect those kids. Um, because it's getting worse and worse. This is the restrained version. There's coming a point where those who've rejected him and who are left behind after God has taken us out of here, we'll be left to deal with that. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. But praise God, if you know Jesus Christ, you'll be taken out of here. Let's stand together.